pleasure to welcome everybody today to the latest in our Excellence in Leadership lecture series. And so we have uh, speakers on campus every three or four weeks, right, to uh, try to expose our uh, students and faculty and friends, right, to different kinds of career paths and how people made it to top um, leadership positions. Okay, so to tell their own stories from a variety of industrial leaders and business leaders from all over the North Country and beyond. And so today, we're welcoming Mr. John Trimble, who's the president and uh, CEO of CNS Companies in uh, Syracuse, New York. So he's a little bit beyond the North Country, okay? But uh, Syracuse is my hometown. So, uh, I'm very glad to see a fellow son of Syracuse here and survivor of those cold winters, though he made it even worse, right? He moved out to Oswego, <coughs> County, Oswego County, and he's living right in that, snow you know, snowbelt path. Right up in New Mexico, New York. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, in case you don't know, um, we have a lot of uh, graduates um, from SUNY Canton who work down at CNS, and a lot of students have had internships there. So he's a really good guy to get to know. Okay. In case you're interested in uh, moving into a future in that area. Um, now, nobody's perfect. Right, and so uh, Mr. Trimble got his uh, associate's degree yeah. down at Alfred State. What's up with that? Tough, and then man. jumped right over SUNY Canton, right, to go to that, that other place that um, kind of deals with engineering subjects down the road. I can never remember their name. <laughs> it starts with a C or something. Clark? 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 Yes. And so he got his bachelor's in uh, Clarkson in civil environmental and structural engineering. And so he's been with CNS for a long time. He's been there since 1990. And uh, he's responsible for overseeing lots of their design and construction projects. And then those projects are all over the place. Right? We, have, we have some on our own campus. Yeah. Okay, the CARC was uh, a project that uh, CNS was uh, involved in. But they've also been involved in the Eisenhower locks up in Messina. And uh, you may have heard that the governor has just allocated $50 million to um, basically rebuild the fairgrounds right down in Syracuse. And uh, they've got a major project going there, right? And in lots of places in between. And so just lots of really good stuff. And you know, kind of the um, most important thing I think about CNS is that they're known as a quality outfit. Okay, strong design, strong execution, done on time. And so, you know, that's of course what you want in a company that you hire to put up something. And so, um, he's also a PE, okay, which is very important <coughs> in the civil engineering field, right, a, a licensed professional engineer. And he's also a LED, lead, okay, AP. And he's associated with a number of the uh, councils on this, the American Council of uh, engineering uh, companies, for example, and so uh, that's kind of giving back, okay, when, um, you know, you're able to um, uh, take your talents, and especially somebody as uh, high up in the organization as him, being involved in a professional society is a wonderful thing. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. John Trimble. appreciate everybody being here. Um, like this to be uh, interactive, so if you have questions as I go, please feel free to ask. Uh, what I'm going to cover uh, today is uh, who CNS is, a little bit about our organization. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on CNS though because we're really talking about broader concepts here in leadership and also uh, careers in engineering and construction. So, uh, But I do want you to get a sense of who we are. Uh, as an organization. I'll give you a sense of my background, um, uh, which uh, uh, the president just uh, covered briefly, and tell you where I came from. Um, our leadership strategy, I'm going to spend most of the talk on just how we view leadership, and based on my, what, 26 years at CNS now, uh, how I've seen things happen, uh, and what, what allows people to move forward in their career in an organization like CNS and what things hold people back uh, in that regard as well. Uh, and then uh, kind of talk about a new concept which is really where we're migrating to as an organization <laughs> uh, and that's more distributed leadership and self-management. Uh, so there'll be some pieces of that I hope, I hope are of interest to you and maybe something a, a little different and then we can 
have some, some additional questions afterwards. So who's CNS? Um, we put some work into as, as, as much as this seems simple, uh, but we try to uh, def put effort into defining ourselves simply so that everybody knows what we do. And in one sentence, what we do is we plan, plan, design, construct, and maintain the built natural environments. That's what we do. Uh, we touch almost anything that you can imagine as engineers, whether it's uh, civil and environmentally oriented, or whether it's building oriented, or whether it's infrastructure. We get involved in, in all those things. And the whole purpose of why our company exists and what drives the individuals who come there to, to uh, uh, do more than just get a paycheck uh, is our purpose. And that's to improve the communities that we serve, uh, but also give opportunities for our team to grow. Uh, those are the two things that, that, that drive us. We have core values, and we say if you don't espouse to these four core values, uh, we're probably not a good fit for you, and, 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 uh, and you, know, you may not be a good fit for us. Authenticity, uh, bring in your perspective, bring in it honestly. Uh, team spirit, working within a team, huge in our business. We're constantly working together with multiple teams at different times. Uh, integrity, uh, doing the right thing when nobody's looking, uh, and then having an all-in mentality as it relates to uh, when you're engaged in CNS activities, working for our clients, we need to make sure that you're all in with what you're doing. And we're what's called a consulting engineering firm and contractor. So what we do is we do projects for owners. Uh, we've done a couple here, uh, which was mentioned earlier. And I'll speak to a couple others to give you a sense of the different things we get into. Uh, but we have about 400 employees. Uh, our offices are uh, in the Northeast, uh, here in New York. Uh, we're in Albany, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo. In the Great Lakes, we're in Cleveland, Detroit. In the Southwest, we're in San Diego, Sacramento, and Phoenix. And then in the Southeast, we're in Orlando. Uh, so those are the locations we have offices. Types of things we get into on the design and construction side, buildings and facilities. Uh, transportation systems, uh, aviation work, environmental work, and civil and site infrastructure. And we work for uh, clients on the public side uh, as well as on the private side. A couple things that we're involved in that, that are ongoing now or recently completed I thought might give you a sense of, of, of the things we do. Uh, if, has anybody here flown out of Syracuse Airport recently? Happen. Okay. Um, if if you flew out out of there five years ago, there were two different uh, security checkpoints, and those went to the two different terminals. Uh, what we did is we put a new level on the uh, on the airport structure, and then had the, the <coughs> security checkpoint be central, and then move out to those terminals. And that was all uh, related to security and federally funded. And that was a CNS job that we designed. And we also did, we're the construction manager overseeing the construction. And that was about $50 million uh, worth of improvement. Uh, Interstate 81, I'm not sure if people have heard about the project in, in central New York that's going on with 81 uh, that goes right down the middle of the city. Uh, they're deciding what to do with that. The Department of Transportation is <coughs> going to get torn down and be a boulevard, or it's going to remain a viaduct with elevated roadway. And we're on the team to evaluate that now, and we're going through that work in support of the DOT. Uh, it's going to be anywhere from an $800 million to a $1 billion project uh, when, they, when they move forward with it. Um, Novellus, uh, that, I bring that up because that's a, in Oswego County. They're a large uh, aluminum manufacturer, uh, but Alcoa also ships material from them for them. We do some work at Alcoa as well. And what they did is they just put in three new lines uh, to accommodate the F-150. Uh, if anybody has, a, anybody have a Ford F-150 truck here? Nobody? One, okay. Best selling truck in America, right? Yep. Uh, they're going all aluminum products, right? <coughs> so, so the new F-150s are gonna be all aluminum based. Uh, so what Novellus did is they put uh, $350 million into their plant to create enough rolled aluminum to satisfy Ford's needs for just the, the F-150, not any other vehicle line, just the F-150. Uh, and then 
after they stamped those parts out of that roll, we actually did a recycle facility where they ship the material back and we bring it in, process it, and then put it back into the, uh, the aluminum uh, smelting process. So that was a typical job that we did. We designed it and did the construction of that. Lakeview Amphitheater, if anybody's involved in, in Syracuse area, there's a new amphitheater there. Uh, we were involved in the design and, and build of that, which just happened recently. It's on Onondaga Lake. So those were all design and construction management. Some construction projects where we're actually a contractor. Uh, we're a union contractor, so we're uh, signatory with pipe fitters, the carpenters, the millwrights, the iron workers, the laborers, uh, masons, all the, all the trades, and we'll run anywhere from 50 to 100 um, union folks uh, on a regular basis uh, within Central New York. Uh, we're doing work over here at Corning Canton. We just did a glass furnace installation. We have some additional work coming on there so we didn't design that but we were hired to actually install uh, the furnace as a contractor uh, the novellas plant expansion i mentioned we were involved in the design and construction of that and we recently completed the eisenhower lock uh, the the uh, miter gate <coughs> upgrades uh, at both snell and uh, the eisenhower lock and that all took place in the winter uh, so you can imagine what that would feel like being down in that uh, lock uh, 50 to 75 feet below uh, the surface grade and seeing that uh, ice is forming on the, the miter gates themselves because it just kind of leaks through and then it freezes and it's just like a big block of ice there and it's cold, cold. So just wanted to give you a sense for some of the projects that, that we've been involved in and with these projects every trade um, that we have in the organization uh, would be involved, okay? So we have architects, structural engineers, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, life safety, communications, HVAC specialists, uh, all those trades that we bring in, uh, in addition to our civil engineering group that also does transportation and civil related work. Any questions on any of that? Okay, keep rolling. I won't go into this in detail, but this is, uh, this is, uh, my background, uh, I did go to Mexico Academy schools, um, Regents Diploma. Um, I didn't have AP classes uh, in Mexico. They didn't, they didn't uh, provide them at that time. Uh, that was a huge miss from my point of view as I went into calculus and other coursework when I went into college and uh, it was all new to me. Um, but uh, I ended up building my own house in, in, uh, in Mexico and uh, that's kind of kept me there ever since. Um, I worked construction through college, wasn't sure whether I wanted to do engineering or construction. Uh, that's why I went to Alfred State, because they offered both uh, hands-on trades uh, curriculum as well as engineering. I ended up staying in the engineering science uh, and then transferred, as was mentioned earlier, uh, to Clarkson and got my uh, Bachelor of Science in 90. And um, had a lot of bills to pay and I went to work the day after my graduation. Uh, May 20th, 1990 was graduation day. That happened to be my birthday. <laughs> Drove home, went back, went to work Monday, May 21st. Uh, been working ever since. Um, and then for me within CNS, I've really worked in many parts of the, of the organization. Uh, I did uh, highway inspection uh, to start on the transportation side, and I got into some airport design work, highway bridge design. So you can see those top three are really civil in nature, which is where my background was in schooling. Uh, but then I moved to really where my passion was, which was vertical work. Uh, so being a structural engineer, um, a civil structural, I could do civil work, but I really wanted to do building work. So I got into the industrial and facilities design group. And I would just say, uh, don't be pigeonholed by your educational focus. The reality is uh, follow your passion, follow what you want to do. Uh, your education gets you to a certain place. It gives you good analytical skills. It gives you the ability to, uh, it, it gives you rite of passage uh, to <coughs> organizations like ours, but then follow where your passion takes you. Don't get, don't feel hung up on, uh, on what you do. In fact, our previous conversation, uh, I think it was mentioned, would you say a third of the individuals who go into engineering never practice engineering because they get into different 
different career path. Uh, so as you can see, I got into, then I got into construction, uh, construction management, and then uh, actually started our construction business back in 1998. So CNS never did contracting. Uh, we started that in 1998, and now it's uh, about 40% of our revenues. Um, so it's been a growing part of our business. With that, I, I uh, migrated into chief operating officer position and now um, doing what I'm doing today, uh, which is overseeing all the operations uh, for the organization. Uh, it was mentioned I'm still involved in projects. I am because we run lean and mean. Uh, we need to have low administrative. Uh, the, the marketplace is very competitive, so you gotta, you gotta take out waste, and we run a lean organization in that regard. So uh, I'm involved in projects as well as uh, administratively running parts of the, of the company along with others. Any questions on that? Good. Tastes okay? Everybody can hear okay? Yes, sir. You just mentioned that 40% of your revenue comes from construction board portion. Yes. How about your personnel? How many, how many personnel are in construction sector? How many are engineering? We have we average about um, 80 in our our construction sector <coughs> uh, and about 320 in our in our engineering. Maybe you do the math. The construction really is problems. Well, um, you're buying material. Uh, in addition, so your revenues will go go much larger than just selling professional hours like you are in the engineering side. So, so you can't. It's a little bit apples and oranges. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so our organization, we just actually uh, pulled our, our leadership team together. We're going through a, a transition. I just transitioned into my position, and many others in CNS are transitioning into. Uh, new positions as kind of our generation. Uh, the founders of the company uh, and the people that were involved are kind of reaching retirement age. So us that have been here a while are now taking the reins. So we went away and we said we gotta uh, do a little strategic retreat and, and talk about what's important to us as a team and what we want out of the organization. <coughs> and we used a book called uh, The Advantage. And um, I'm uh, I'm not a big leadership or management book guy. Uh, I think when it's all said and done, a lot more said than done uh, when it relates to those things. But this one resonated with me and it res resonated with our team because it was all focused on not deep strategic planning. It was focused on attacking the root causes of dysfunction in politics in an organization. Clarity in an organization. So individuals who are on our team aren't unclear about what our direction is. They also aren't unclear on what's important for us, to us. That's that core values piece. And the fact that if you have a strong organization, that's a much greater competitive advantage in business uh, than, um, than having the best strategy. Because if you have the best strategy but people aren't working together and they aren't happy about what they're doing, it's not going to work in the end. Uh, so it's all about uh, making sure that we're on track uh, as an organization from a cultural uh, perspective. So two requirements for success that they outline in that book are smart strategies, uh, strategy, marketing, finance, and technology, and healthy strategies. Minimize politics, minimize confusion, make morale high. Here's an example. We had the SU game. Anybody watch the SU game Friday? Okay, good win. Good win Sunday. Unless you don't like SU, I guess. But we have a, you know, we have people have vacation time. They have uh, plenty of time that they can take on their own. And when there's S, there was an SU game and it was tipped off at 12:15. Said, got with our team. We said, you know, most people are going to probably take off the afternoon and go watch it, uh, or they're going to stream it. You know, they're interested in it. So guess what? I am too. We are too. So what did we do? We got uh, 22 flat or, or pizzas, 450 slices of, of pizza, and we washed it in our training room. And we said, everybody come down instead of taking off and hitting the local tavern or doing whatever you're going to do to watch it. And that's what we did. And we watched the first half, and it amazed me how after at halftime, 
I assumed and we and we wanted everybody to stay uh, or we offered that people went back to their their jobs because they just felt good about the fact they were watching it they might stop back down later in the second half but we didn't tell anybody had to go back to work in fact just the opposite we said watch it as long as you want but people weren't resisting somebody telling them something they were just kind of taking it how they wanted to do it they were making a choice huge difference right instead of us making a choice for them and the first half all right everybody back to work because they have pressure we have to do the uh, available time work we have to charge the time to correct to the projects so they would appreciate the, you know the uh, upper management will offer them this opportunity but for them themselves they also have the pressure to yeah. to charge the time like that's not, true not to overly uh, abuse the uh, liberty of the upper management given that's right. Yep, that's absolutely correct. <coughs> They're making that judgment, you know. So, um, high productivity, low turnover. We're an organization. We have about three percent turnover, and that's voluntary and involuntary. So that's usually a lot. That includes retirements and different things. So, uh, it's very low. Some say too low, but it works for us. Um, but the the moral of the story here is, a lot of companies are are very good at um, are very good at the SMART goals and, and the strategy piece and they can put together a strategic plan that sits on the, on the shelf and uh, collects dust, really good at that, um, but they're not as good as the healthy piece and those things that are kind of the softer side. And um, anybody here fly Southwest Airlines ever? Right? One of the highest customer satisfaction airlines in, in, in the business continually, right? The CEO of, of, uh, of uh, Southwest was uh, interviewed by the fellow who, who wrote the Advantage book. And he, he said, I want to know what your strategy is. And he laid out a lot of this issue of clarity, uh, harmony, working with people, uh, and making it simple to work at Southwest. And the fellow who wrote the book, Patrick Lencioni, said it after he interviewed him, he said, that just seems too simple. Why don't you think everybody's doing this? And he said, because I think people believe it's below them. I think they think when they get to a certain position that there's got to be more to it than that. i got to be cracking the atom. i got to be doing that strategic plan. It's not just about this piece. And that resonated with me. So Southwest, using that example, what they did is they got together as a team and they said, this is the clarity piece. How will we succeed? What's the most important thing uh, that's gonna allow us to succeed? So what they did is they started to put, uh, everybody started throwing out what they thought was important to Southwest's success, okay? So you can see on the board here, uh, humor, low fares, no frills, quick turnaround, one plane type <coughs> so that it simplified the maintenance piece. Employee focused, no travel agents, friendly customer service, regional flights, secondary airports, open seating. And then they bags fly for free. And then what they did is they said, okay, out of all of those, do we have some, some that feed into others? And what they came up with was that, that out of all of these, and, and, and this is simplified a bit for the, for the purpose of presentation, but what they did was they found out that many of these fed into <coughs> three things that they said, this is who we are, this is what we're gonna focus on, and that's the clarity that we're gonna give our team. So that they're, they're not unsure about what front office is thinking versus what they're thinking on the ground. Reliable and on time, Friendly customer service and low fares. The three things that they say we will not sacrifice. Because if we do, then we've lost our focus, we've lost our business model. We did that same exercise uh, at CNS as part of this retreat. And that exercise resulted for us is we need to have the best people and talent. We want to be the place where the best people choose to work. That's different than being the place, that's different than being the best place to work because a lot of times you can be the best place to work but not be 
surviving as a business, right? And so we want people motivated that want to come in that are all in, and then they choose to work at CNS because that's where the best people choose to work. Value creation. Uh, one thing that I had to learn after going through college and making my way through CNS is that it's all about creating value. It's very simple. That's a simple statement, but that's what it's about. Sometimes when you're ground down by the, you know, the coursework and everything associated with your educational process, you get into your job and you're feeling it's just another exercise in you know, analysis or coursework. No, when you get into that, that, uh, that, career, uh, that career opportunity, you need to focus on creating value in everything you do internally and externally. If we're not creating value for our clients, they aren't going to hire us. If we're not creating value internally within CNS, with our coworkers, it's, we're not going to be the best we can be. And then lastly for us, it was a client-centric attitude. So we had probably 90 things on the board, and we did that arrow process, and it all came down to these three things. And we said, that's it. That's what it is for us. So I want to drop back a little bit um, and, and talk about what I've seen within CNS uh, and other professional organizations uh, in regards to socio-political or cultural realities. Okay, what what it, what it what what it's like? What's 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 the what's it feel? What's the culture feel like within CNS? And things that I've noticed, and and this is unique in professional organizations because again, people are. They self-select to be on your team, and then they, they, they have, you can't control what they do, okay? You can only set up a framework to help them succeed. So what I've noticed is vision guides focus. You need some vision uh, for the organization, but the reality is execution produces results. And what I've seen in CNS, and I've seen in other uh, industries, is the visionaries, the people who have these great ideas, uh, they're forward thinking, futurists, if you will. <coughs> people admire them, they admire what they do, but they don't rally behind those guys because they're not in the trenches getting it done. So who they, who they, who they rally behind are the, the women and the men who are actually making it happen. And, and that's where that sense of, of team comes in. And leaders that execute they're the ones that are respected and followed. Um, and, I, and I like this term, implementation science is more important than decision science. You can analyze something to death, but what are you gonna get done? We had a discussion around our strategic plan that our strategic plan is to do stuff. You know? And then in creative organizations, which engineering uh, uh, firms are, social controls govern. You, you can't stand there and dictate to a professional organization how they're going to do something, uh, what they feel, uh, tell them uh, where you're headed and have them feel good about it. You need to respect that the system controls. And what we need to do as leaders, we need to sense and adapt, not command and control. And typically what I've noticed is uh, and again, in, in technical organizations, socially controlled organizations, leadership comes from within the team. Why is that typically? Because it's all relationship empowered. We have had terrible experiences where we've hired people into senior level positions at CNS and they had no relationships when they came in. We put them in a position and the system rejected them. They didn't have relationships. They didn't have the respect. Guess what? They weren't with us very long because I couldn't make it happen. They had to make it happen, and they didn't. Uh, but typically in our organization, what I've noticed, I mentioned I was there 26 years, uh, I never begged for a promotion. I was only in the position I'm in because I respect the fact that the team is the only, the only group that can put me in that position. It's not going to be the president and CEO. My job is to make his decision easy, right? Because we're doing the right things and getting things done. So the team giveth and the team taketh away. 
So when you get into leadership positions, there's something you need to remember, that the higher up the ladder you go, the more your backside's exposed, <laughs> right? <laughs> so people can take shots at you, and you need to respect everybody on the team and what they're doing. And again, that gets back to our core values, which we say again are non-negotiable. We need people to be authentic, have a team spirit, integrity, and all-in attitude. If you don't have that, you're not going to be on the CNS team long. And if you don't show those qualities um, in, a, in a very forward way, you're probably not going to be in a leadership position or be in one long. I keep thinking that this is advancing, but it's not. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, a new concept that, that uh, we're looking into um, and really I think we're evolving to as an organization and it's called holacracy, uh, this idea of distributed leadership and self-management. Again, this is in uh, creative organizations like, like engineering firms or higher end construction firms. It's taken from a book that Frederick Lillo is doing and this present, part of the presentation comes from an overview uh, that was, uh, came out of the Change Factory. Um, but I'll start by saying, uh, have our traditional business structures become outdated? That's the question they ask. <coughs> and I think they have in creative organization. Surveys of people working at the bottom of pyramids, organizational pyramids, consistent report that work is more often than not dread and drudgery, not filled with passion and purpose. What a drag, you put all this time and effort into your schooling, uh, you learn great skills as you graduate, and then you go to work and you go, this is it, this is what I did this for? That's what we have to change. Everybody sees Dilbert? We keep ourselves in check because we have a guy who's got a Dilbert calendar and he drops it on one of our desks every day, whoever it most applies to. <laughs> and, it, and it keeps us, keeps us kind of, keeps it real. And uh, it, it, is it important to have goals? Yeah, you need, you need goals to succeed. Good, because my goal is to become an Uber driver. I quit. What is your goal? He's talking to his boss. Reducing employee turnover. That is, uh, Dilbert is usually more fact than fiction. And that's what we've got to push back on. And that's what this distributed leadership concept is about. And it talks about the evolution of organizational structures. And I know there's a lot of text here. Um, <coughs> can you see that text in the back? Mm -hmm. You can see that? Okay. So they, they, uh, they defined these uh, organizational uh, structures and how they've evolved over time. And it starts with the wolf pack uh, just being uh, that whole issue of just having whoever's the strongest leads and gives everybody else direction. Okay, it's that power, power of whoever is the leader and they manage through fear. In a wolf pack, if you're not doing what that person wants you to do, that individual, you're gonna be gone, or in, or, in, or in nature, you're gonna get killed by that more powerful individual. So that's where it started, and then it evolved into the Army, uh, what they identify as the Army structure, highly formal roles, that pyramid structure, and command and control, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna control everything that goes on in this organization. I'm gonna have a strategic plan. By God, we're gonna follow that. Even if things are changing, we came up with this plan, it's gotta be right, right? Then it moved to the machine where it's the goal is to beat the competition. So it took it from an internal focus of control and power to uh, trying to motivate the team to beat your competitors. So you've got control over the what is maintained by the organization, but the freedom of how is done by the individual. Okay, so we're getting there. We're getting to a place where it feels a little bit more fun and fulfilling to work in an organization. 
And then a family organization is where I've matured to next. The focus on culture empowerment and management through group and subgroup consensus. <coughs> That's probably where we've been, uh, CNS. We've probably been between machine and family, and I think we're evolving into this next one, which is the living organism, which is what this distributed leadership is all about. Self-management, you're empowered by purpose and a sense of inner rightness. You know what the right thing to do is. You just need to act on that and be allowed to act on that. And the whole thing that's pushed all of this is the increased ability to collaborate and getting information. And the internet's the big piece of that. And it's pushed organizational evolution. This went on for centuries. As you look at, at, at these up here, they went on for centuries, these two are relatively new because it's taken all or the organization and communication is what's driving them. So what is what is this? What's it look like? Self-management. Self-management is a system uh, that's based on peer relationships, that relationship piece I talked about. You guys do project work together, have your teams. That's probably one of the more fulfilling things you do because there's interaction. Uh, there's combined, uh, combined purpose. Structures and practices exist where people have high autonomy. We're not telling you how to do things. And you're accountable for coordinating with others. Power and control is deeply embedded throughout the organization, not tied to the specific positions of a few top leaders. It's easy to get a big head you get into these positions where you're running an organization. The reality is you're not running that organization. That organization is mainly running itself. You're just privileged to be in the position where your face is there where you can maybe <coughs> provide leadership that hopefully is going to make that, that organization even better. Wholeness. Uh, orange and green organizations encourage people to show their narrow professional selves. So again, the orange and green, to go back, the machine and the family showing your narrow professional selves. Whereas teal organizations, which is this self-management uh, distributed leadership, um, creates an environment wherein people feel free to fully express themselves, bringing a higher level of energy and passion and creativity to work. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Lastly, evolutionary purpose. So self-management, wholeness with you as part of the team, and evolutionary purpose. Strategies are based on a sense of what the world is asking for. Agile practices sense and respond. I was talking about that. Instead of trying to command and control and predict. And usually, usually these organizations outpace, the, the organizations that have these three, these three pieces outpace other organizations in profitability, but profitability is not the goal. It's an outcome because you're doing the right things. And then this general role, rule as you, as you move into leadership positions, the level of consciousness of an organization cannot exceed the level of consciousness of its leader. My feeling is I can hold CNS back a lot more than I can probably impact the trajectory of the company. I just got to make sure I don't hold us back. Basic assumptions, and think about this as you're working with your coworkers. Think of you in this environment. Trust. We relate to one another with an assumption of positive intent. How often do we do that, right? Usually you're saying, somebody's trying to screw me here. I just haven't figured out who or why yet. Until proven wrong, you trust. And that's the default means of engagement. Freedom and accountability go hand in hand. You have all the freedom in the world but there are requirements that you need to bring forward to the team. All business information is open to all every month. We give all of our financials to every person in the company, from our repro department manager 
up through uh, senior levels in the organization. Don't feel like people can't handle bad news. Share it. Learn from it. Many times we try to protect our own team from bad news because we think, well, I'm the leader and, and I shouldn't be sharing this. No, we need to share everything. Collective intelligence, decisions made, sharing, uh, sharing information with each other. And then responsibility, accountability, we each have a responsibility for the whole organization not just our role in the business area. That's a key thing in our organization. We have 400 people. People, if they get focused just on their piece and they don't care about anybody else's part of the organization, we fail. You own the whole company. And we must be good at holding others accountable for their commitments, because it falls apart. If you give all this freedom, but, pe but people aren't holding each other accountable in the system, the whole thing falls apart. So what's this do? Liberates energies, individual energies are boosted when people identify with a purpose greater than themselves. That's what we try to do, doing bigger work than just yourself or just CNS. Increased self-management creates an enormous motivation and energy. We stop working for bosses and we work to meet our inner standards, which usually are higher than our boss's standards. Every teammate senses the surrounding reality, sensing, again, sensing your organization, sensing the marketplace, what's going on. We call that emotional intelligence. Don't wait for direction. Because many times, by the time I give direction to somebody, it's either going to be ill-informed or late. Roll with it, right? You've got the information. They need to be made everywhere, all the time. You have the right culture in your organization, then strategy happens everywhere, not out of a strategic plan. So out of that strong team, trust, respect, diversity, communication, <coughs> guiding vision and purpose, leaders who engage in power and serve, servant leadership. That's what works in professional organizations. And relationships is identified almost across the board in all these. You gotta work at it. So in closing, I um, wanna give an example of, uh, I went to some training at MIT. Uh, it was actually about managing technical organizations. And uh, they gave a, a pretty interesting um, uh, thing that happened as they had, uh, similar to what SUNY Canton's doing here, they had people from the business environment come and speak at, at, at us. MIT. And they had three different people. They had uh, computer-based, this is for their computer-based uh, group. Uh, they had Akers, who was the CEO of IBM at the time. They had Steve Jobs, who obviously was with Apple at the time. And then they had Bill Gates of Microsoft. Akers comes in, two limos, first two rows of the, con of the lecture hall were reserved for his people. Right? <laughs> Steve Jobs, he came in a rental car, a little more down to earth, keeping it real, right? Had a technical discussion, but went real deep into the technical discussion and really was interested in picking the brains <coughs> of, the, of the team there and see who he might want to hire. A little selfish, right? But Steve Jobs, if anybody's read the book or seen the movie, driven guy, right? Lastly, Bill Gates came. This was when Microsoft wasn't who it is today, but it wasn't a small company. It wasn't like he was just starting up. He came mass transit, just him. Rode the T. Anybody from Boston? Rode the T to MIT. Talked about his vision for the future. Didn't talk about, didn't talk about Microsoft at all. Talked about where he saw the world heading as it related to leveraging that technology. And then afterwards, he sat on the floor and just interacted with all the students. So I thought that was a good example of probably some of this leadership that we talked about where he was much more in that teal area with how 
he, uh, he handled things. Thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes, sir. You know, the idea of distributed leadership is you know, kind of scary, I think, for, for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like for people in higher positions because, you know, another way of looking at distributed leadership is, you know, following the chaos. Yes. And so how do you keep it from being chaos? No, that's a great question. And, and I would say 10 years ago, we couldn't have done it. Five years ago, we probably couldn't do what we're doing now because we didn't have what we call the right people on the bus and the right seats. <laughs> You know, so, so you have people on the bus, right? If your company is a bus, this is comes from good to great, uh, book good to great. Um, you might have people on the bus that are good people, good to be in the company, but they aren't in the right seat on the bus. Or you might have people that are on the bus that shouldn't be on the bus. Or you have some holes where you need to get some new people on the bus. But I think the only way that I think this works, to your point, is you've got to have total trust that the team you have is the right team to make this happen. <coughs> and if you don't, and I'm in a fortunate position where, um, where, where I feel we do, but if you don't, I don't think it works. So you've been there 26 years. How many people did you jump over, you know, more senior than you? You got president. They didn't mind it. No, it's a great question. Um, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up and it was instilled on me values of um, be very respectful to your elders, uh, focus on, on uh, doing what you're told. I'm more of a, I'm a Gen Xer, but really more of a traditionalist in mindset. Um, but two things happened, I would say. Uh, I put the effort into those relationships with those individuals. So some of those were my biggest advocates uh, on when some opportunities came up. Some of it was luck of timing, that the, the leader of the organization was of the same uh, age as the, these other individuals, and he was going to transition out. They weren't going to transition into those spots, even though they might still be there after he transitions out, but we're not going to change that position for a two-year period. So they, they realized that. And, you know, I, I think performance. Uh, I took a couple business units, and this is not, not just me, because it was all about how we did it with that team environment, but I took a five-person team that we went into that industrial market, and we went to 50 in uh, four years. Uh, so I had a team that really responded to the approach that I, I took and uh, that helped justify it as well. And it was, it really stepped, uh, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't like a, a pluck in place. I really took on a little more responsibility, a little more responsibility, a little more responsibility. So there wasn't uh, anarchy. You know, I believe in evolution, not revolution. So that's how things happen, especially in technical organizations. And it just kind of evolved, and nobody thought anything of it. Jim, so you talked about setting a standard for yourself higher than what you lost. <coughs> Part of our role as educators, educators is to instill that. How would you go about approaching a student and try to having them learn how to set their own standards higher than ours? Um, that's a good question. I guess I'll relate it to our business. Um, we, we put time and effort into uh, what the goal is but we don't put time and effort into means and methods. So you need to have some sort of accountability uh, metric that you're driving towards, but we try to keep it as open-ended as possible because it stifles creativity if we don't. So 
So I think, uh, you know, just being as open-ended as possible with here's where we want to get, but I'm not going to tell you every step of the way on how to get there. Um, I guess that would be my, my advice. Your job's a lot tougher than mine. Got a question? Yes, What's an example of where you set your standards higher than your companies? <coughs> Uh, um, I would say it's on uh, doing what you say you're going to do. I get physically sick if I don't, if I commit to somebody to do something and I don't do it. Even if the world comes crashing in, I'll, I'll work through the night because I committed to that person to do it. Uh, and and that, that's not everybody, but that's, that's that's one area I would say. You know, if we miss a deadline, and it happens, seeing us misses deadlines, our clients expecting something, didn't happen. Why didn't it happen, right? Um, I can't, can't miss that. I can't, I can't miss those, <coughs> those expectations. That's, that's. Is that all we have to? I guess, yeah. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Greg just appears everywhere. Yeah. Not very photogenic. Anybody yeah. else? Um, so obviously we learned that you're from a technical background. Right? Where you, um, you took this management position all the way from your hard work through engineering um, positions. So I have two questions. One question is how did you <coughs> Um, manage to learn this management skills uh, out based out from your um, you know, daily engineering practice. Um, the other uh, question is to how do you advise the students in terms of balancing their goals between engineering and management? That's, that's a great question. That's something I probably should have brought up. Um, I will say this that, um, you know, I, I stand here today and, and this. This all sounds good, and hopefully it's motivating for you. But you got to touch you got to touch the bases, right? I mean, I couldn't if I didn't work on design teams for ten years. Uh, if I didn't go after different opportunities within CNS, that was another big part of it. Is I jumped around in the organization, so I had broader context for everything we did than probably others maybe did because they stayed in their in their comfort zone and then that was good for them and good for the organization but it wasn't for me um, so you've got to touch you got to touch those bases and not try to <coughs> short circuit the the transition from doing the production work to leadership because if you do there'll be resentment you won't have all the context that you need to be effective and I think my approach is just an extension of our previous CEO and how he ran the organization. Uh, it took us really to that machine family type environment. It was more interpersonal. Now I'm kind of taken off from that into that next level. Um, because our students also engineering advice on how to balance that. Yeah, how how the for, for, for example, some students will want to focus on uh, construction. Some students will, will, will like to continue on the engineering design. Right. And then, you know, what would you encourage them to do at this stage if they want to later on they want to take a, a, a leadership position in the organization? What can what, what can they do right now to prepare them for their future objectives? I'd say get as much broad exposure as you can to different parts of engineering to include the interpersonal piece, uh, reacting to people. I mean, I, I sat, I was downstairs because um, I wanted to kind of get a sense for the campus a little bit and I sat down in JT's cafe. That's what they call me at the office. I felt right at home there. Um, but here's what I noticed. People sitting down. I was doing that too, okay? But there isn't the level of interpersonal uh, communication and interaction now, and that kills us when we're 
we're doing project work. So focusing on that, working within a team, that that is key. That's key. Interpersonal skills. Yes. Yeah, what we term emotional intelligence. That sense and respond, you're only gonna be effective at that if you can sense, right? You're getting enough context from from what's going on around you that you can make judgments. And that's uh you need to be you need to be all in, you need to be you need to to um, be curious. Curious is the word I'm looking for. And then once you're in the organization, I would say move around as much as you can. Um, the whole and instead of or, right? Try to find those opportunities. Try to find that. I, I want to do engineering and I want to go out on a construction job because I'm going to be better. Not that one career path or another. The, they say the tyranny of the or versus the genius of the and, right? So try to find that, that and in your work here and when you get into your careers, try to find that and. Maybe one more question if somebody's got one. Okay. Well, with that, now let's thank uh, Mr. Trimble once again. <laughs> and I'd like to mention a couple of things before we close up. One is that uh, this uh, program is funded by Corning Incorporated. And so we appreciate their financial support. And um, the person who helps organize it is Wax Lasky, it's right there. Okay, and so um, we do this every three or four weeks. And so I encourage you to look for our next one. Okay, now the next one's our Lieutenant Colonel, right? Yeah, yeah. Colonel. And so Michelle we got a, Kilgore from Yeah, Sirius. Michelle Kilgore, she's coming up from um, the air base. Okay. Um, she's uh, actually in, I think, the logistics area right now. But she's um, in the military, she's a lieutenant colonel, and she's one of the very few women to have flown in combat. And with the political science background. That's right. <laughs> and so, very cool person, very good speaker, and so I hope you all be able <coughs> Now, we always like to get a nice photo op at the end, so we've got a little something okay. so that you'll remember us. Okay. Zvi, would you come towards the screen in the center? <laughs> if you don't mind. Sure. sure.